Big Sills! Friday, man. Here we go. Six days out to the NFL draft. Six days out. I don't know how many ways you can cook this pancake, right? <laughs> I mean, how many ways can you flip the pancake here before next Thursday night? And we get a good sense. By the way, I did do what many of you asked me to do. I went back and I listened to that press conference with Howie Roseman and Nick Sirianni. And I'm going to get to that here in a second. Um, it's amazing. And, 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 and by the way, do you know the one thing that I took away from that? Before I get into some of these other comments I want to make here. I am so happy to hear Howie talk draft like I do. Howie's not looking at a particular he's not looking at a particular dude in the draft or a position of need he's looking for playmakers he's looking for people that are playmakers okay playmakers that are going to come in and make a difference on their football team okay difference makers does that tell you it's going to be Bijan at 10 or does that tell you it's going to be Bijan in the draft? I don't know yet. We're going to get to that. Um, before we do, I want to hit on the Matt Patricia hire one more time. A little bit on the five players that were suspended from the NFL. I got a completely different view of this. This is just another sign right here just to show you when the NFL commissioner says that he has the player's best interest at heart, that he never will. I'm not, I'm not giving the players a pass. Because when you walk into a locker room, there's a gigantic guy in a football uniform, and it tells you and it prohibits you from, from sitting there and gambling. You know what I don't like to hear from the media, though? So if the NFL owners told Colin Kaepernick not to kneel, all of you had a problem with that. Hey! Hey! If you are told to wear a particular hat when you go into a place of business that they own, you have to wear the hat. Well, if an NFL owner tells you you can't kneel, why are you bitching then? You know the rules. Oh, I see. Hmm, interesting. So you're picking and choosing here again. You're picking and choosing. Don't all 32 owners have a right to tell? And by the way, I'm on Kaepernick's side. But you gave the NFL a pass for that. And the commissioner lies to you and tells you years after the fact, hey, maybe we should have listened to the guy. Okay? Steve, no, 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 no. No, half of America, Steve. The American... Football fan base is not New York and California or the East Coast. Football is the Midwest and South. It's basically Trump's base. That's the football base. I love how people think our country's run because New York and California have the most people in it. That's not the case. Half the country hated Kaepernick, and the owners allowed it for a little bit. Then all of a sudden, when their advertisers start complaining, the NFL stopped it. And no one's complained about it since. The NFL owners don't like the players dipping their beak inside the gambling because that's where they're starting to make some of their money as they're putting um, – get this as, – as they're putting sports books at Lincoln Financial – and figuring out how to put sports books at Lincoln Financial, they're telling players they can't gamble. Okay, you have a right. It's your business. But let's be fair on both sides of the aisle here. I get it. Don't ever tell me that the owners and the Commissioner of National Football League has the player's best interest. They don't. And Does a place of business have a right to tell you not to kneel in my place, you bet you, your ass they do. If they could tell you not to gamble, they could tell you not to kneel. Okay? They could tell you not to kneel. You're damn right. Use that and apply that. See, I'm just, I'm just a guy that likes to be fair. I'm just a guy that likes to be fair here. 
Again, am I going to do something like that, knowing full well when I walk into an NFL locker room, I see it says gambling is prohibited? No, I'm not going to do that. I'm not going to do that. No, I'm not. I'm not going to put my job in jeopardy. I'm going to have common sense. I'm going to use a brain. Absolutely. But don't don't tell me that you do things in a different way here, that we're doing stuff here, and we sit there and the NFL owners aren't aggravated because you know why? The players always like to try to do what? Upset the model that the owners make money on. Give me a break. Give me a break. Let's move on here. The hiring of Matt Patricia. It's kind of weird in how it went down on the website, right? Kind of weird how it went down. Would you guys make it a hiring? What do you think he brings to the table, Matt Patricia, as he brings his three Super Bowls and I think a pretty good IQ when it comes to defense to the Philadelphia Eagles? Think it's a good hire or a bad hire? And what do you think he brings to the Eagles this year, 2023? What do you think he brings to the table? Experience on defense. And ex- Hey, more so, CJ? Experience in big games. Experience in big games. Now that you have climbed into that level, and the Eagles are at that level now where you're going to be the hunted, Nobody's going to be looking at the Eagles any longer going like this. Hey, man, that team just outlives its expectations. They are just a – what a surprise. There's no surprises in Philadelphia anymore. So what do you do when you have no surprises and you're being the hunted? You bring in professional trappers. That's what I call Matt Patricia. I think he's a professional trapper. You bring professionals in. You bring a higher quality guy into the building. You get a different perspective. You get a guy that is very experienced. And Steve says it too. He brings his experience. Somebody in Sean Desai's ear. Okay. Here's what else I think he brings. What is the number one thing that was known for 19 or 20 years in New England with Belichick and Matt Patricia? What was the one thing that you remember and that you would identify with those two men in New England? What would what would be some of the takeaways? What would be the takeaways with Patricia and Belichick running the defense? And by the way, Brian Flores was part of that. Okay? Brian Flores was on that side of the ball. I think he was instrumental. Okay? Hopefully helping special teams. There'll be more of an eyeball on special teams now because I think everyone knows that Belichick loves special teams. He kind of cut his chops a little bit on special teams, and Patricia will bring some experience to that side of the football as well. Winning, professional. Attention to detail, says Luther. Let me bring you this on what I think he's going to bring. In-game adjustments. And... Game plans and multiple fronts. Follow me here. What was the one great thing that we always said about Belichick football teams? The in-game adjustments, not halftime adjustments, in-game adjustments. And the multiple fronts. Them and the Ravens were the creators of the what? The skies defense and the walk-up defense. Remember how those guys would always be congregated in the middle of the field? and not give the quarterback an idea on where the stronger free safety was, and those guys would just hang in the middle there, hang in the middle there, then they would go to their positions, then they would walk to their true positions, and then if things weren't working in the middle of the football game, what would Belichick and Patricia be doing? They would have end game. They wouldn't wait for halftime. They would scrap a defensive game plan immediately with multiple fronts. How many times did you watch a Patriot game? You saw him in a 34 against the Bills. And then the next week, you watched the Patriots against the Dolphins, and they were in a 43. How many times did you watch a running back that was killing the team the week before for 200 yards? The next week, what? That guy was inactive. They were like a chameleon. 
And to me, I think that's what you're going to see being added to this defense. I think it's a brilliant hire now. Because the one thing that New England got away with and how New England covered some of their deficiencies is that they were chameleons and they got hybrid players. Teddy Bruschi, Vrabel. Go down the list of the guys that you went, man, could he start anywhere else? You put a guy with his hand in the dirt, stick him up in the air on a three-point stance to a two-point stance. Some of these guys were so good at in-game adjustments and hybrid defenses. That's exactly how you cover maybe a lesser talented team. Doesn't, aren't we in a position right now to look at the Eagles and look at those years in New England and go, Boy, I'll tell you what, the defensive guys on that side of the ball, they were they were good, but they weren't spectacular. Remember yesterday I was telling you, can you really name a lot of superstar players that they had on that side of the ball? You can't. Chandler Jones was traded. Richard Seymour. You had guys like Brewski and Hightower, Vince Wolfark. They went out and made moves to get some free agents. Yes, their corners were always good in New England. That's the one thing you can always lean your, your body on and put your hat on the hook on, is that they were always great at the corner position, weren't they? Well, Belichick was a secondary coach first. Then he became a coordinator and linebacker coach. He first started as a secondary guy. And that's kind of how Matt cut his chops too, secondary guy to coordinator. So, I mean, and again, too, Kyle, remember this. Willie McGinnis was not drafted by Belichick. He drafted by Pete Carroll, too, another Carroll guy. Very few of those people that were up there when they were going through their early part of their Super Bowl run were drafted by Bill. They were drafted by the, the prior regime. They weren't drafted by Bill, but Bill knew how to put people in position. Why? He learned it in New York. He learned it in New York. And here's the failure of Matt Patricia as a head coach. Here's the failure of Matt Patricia as a head coach. And it, it, it reared its head for Belichick in Cleveland. Don't, don't you guys remember the story? There was a story when Lawrence Taylor fell asleep in a giant meeting. And he was going over a defensive game plan. I think they were getting ready to play the Eagles. And it was a divisional game. It was a pretty big game. And they're sitting there talking. And after he told them what he had told the defense, as he was the coordinator of the team, obviously, he, he goes like this to him. He goes, hey, I just want you to know, Lawrence Taylor showed up to the meeting 15 minutes late. And, and Parcells looked at him. Okay. He goes, well, I just want you to know. You know what Bill told him? Why'd you start the meeting? And, and, and Bill was taken by that. Belichick was like, what do you mean? He goes, why'd you start the meeting without Lawrence Taylor, the best player on the team? So simple and so common sense. You see, to me personally, I think Bill, when he went to the Jets as the assistant to Parcells, I think that's when he learned how to deal with players better. And how to communicate a tad bit better. Because remember something, right now, the communication in New England is not very good. I mean, you bring in Will Levis, you must hate Mac Jones now. You're trying to trade him. You hate the guy. You bring in another quarterback in. You may take a first. I mean, it's the communication in New England is lost. Why? Because remember what I said the other day, Tone? Between him and Greg Popovich, you had the greatest buffers in the history of locker rooms. Tim Duncan and Tom Brady. This is what he means, guys. You know that stupid shit on the wall? Leave your egos at the door? Well, this is what he means. This is about us. Okay? When those two guys left the locker room, those guys had been bombs. He couldn't connect with Kawhi. He couldn't connect with Kawhi Leonard. The quarterback he has now, it's been a revolving door since, since Tom Brady left. He looks like Belichick Cleveland. Not really the best communicator with his players. 
you always go back to who you are. You, you, you can't change your zebra stripes. So to me, the problem that you have, Patricia is a lot like Belichick. You're trying to tell me you wouldn't want to have Bill Belichick in your locker room helping your defensive guys get ready for a ball game when he's considered one of the best defensive coordinators in the history of the game? Boy, I surely would. Whether he gets along with Darius Slay or not, I don't give a shit. I'll tell you what, Nick Sirianni, after listening to that press conference in my way, I think Nick Sirianni's a lot like Parcells. I think that's a gonna I think that's gonna be a great dynamic. Sirianni has a lot of parcels in him. Has a lot of parcels. There's a there, there's a lot of emotion. You know, when you when you when you talk to Nick, you believe him. When you talk to Patricia and Belichick, I don't know. Okay. By the way. We're going to get to the topics in a sec here. What up, Donnie? Appreciate you all coming aboard. Thank you so much on this Friday, too. Six days out to the draft. Hey, by the way, Jonathan Gannon, I got something for you. And I know everyone now at the NovaCare Center watches the show faithfully. There were only two guys that were in your ass wanting you out of the building. That was Seth and myself. Okay. You don't really believe anybody at WIP, the flagship of the Eagles, was touting that. Or anybody else around the city was touting that this guy is not who he says he is. And that the players stepped up and played in spite of that guy. Now he's taking shit shots at the Eagle media. No, no, no. He's taking shit shots at me and Seth. Because Seth and I were the guys going, this guy ain't who he is. This guy ain't who he is. Dude, you're the head freaking football coach of the Arizona Cardinals. What are you doing acting like C.J. Gardner-Johnson by throwing shade and bullshit at the Philly media? Act like a head coach. Act like you deserve the job. Dude, I'm starting to think you fit right in with the Bidwell family. That's a loser move. I don't give a shit what you think of Seth and me. I personally do not. I don't think you're a good coordinator. I think that Howie, hey, here, let's do this. How many people give Howie the credit for the 70 sacks? Or you give Jonathan Gannon the 70 sack credit? And and for the record, when you needed a coordinator, it was in the freaking Super Bowl. Not against the Tennessee Titans or some shit team like the Texans. They needed you in the Super Bowl, dude. And you were a no-show. You were a no-show. You couldn't stop that team. What were you doing playing man coverage when you hadn't all year? And what were you doing passing off receivers when you hadn't done that technique all year? You got your ass Handed to you by Andy Reid. Andy Reid handed you an opportunity to win that game in the first half. He came back. He put the game plan together in the second half. In game adjustments. And he schooled you. Schooled you. Bro, I didn't need you to be the best coordinator of the number two defense against the shitty Texans. I needed you to beat Mahomes and Andy Reid, and you couldn't do it. You couldn't even – dude, the only reason that the Chiefs aren't still scoring, the clock ran out. That guy's a stupid ass. I question that guy now. What are you – dude, why are you acting like a butthurt player? You're the head football coach. You're, I mean, look, does Sirianni do shit that I don't like? I didn't like him on the park bench screaming at the Colts fans about Frank Reich. I get it. I, You know I love Frank. You know I love Frank. But come on, man. Act like a leader, not a follower. 
only people in Philadelphia that were kicking Jonathan Gannon's head in every day was Seth Joyner and Dan Cilio. Am I wrong? Even my harshest critics that are in here right now know that that's the truth. Even you guys know that. Come on, man. When that defense needed you to be a leader and be a coordinator, you were nowhere. Dak Prescott ripped you a new one. He was 78% completion percentage. Every single freaking time you played against elite quarterbacks, you got your shit kicked in. Am I wrong? Bro, when I was listening to that soundbite yesterday, him talking to the, does Arizona even have a media core? Seriously, do they have a media core? They can't. Hey, for the record, one of the reasons that I think it's one of the lamest media cores, I was supposed to do a radio show in Phoenix. After one week, I said, I'm not moving to that thing. Not if you're having organizations dictate programming. That's not for me. (laughs) That was not for me. That's the truth. That's what happened. I said, not happening. Big Seals doesn't leave the Dan Cave for nothing. That's not what I do. I don't even know if they have a media. I saw that soundbite, and I'm like, look, you know I'm not a defender of the Philly media. But I will say this. That media core is as hard as anybody in the nation. And do they kowtow to a couple teams in that city? Yes. I get it. It's their jobs. you got to have access. I'm not killing anybody for that. And of all the cities, them, Pittsburgh, Buffalo, The New York media, they like to make a story about them. They like to somehow insert themselves in the story. The only reason that I'm inserting it here is because the only two people that I could think of that kicked Jonathan Gannon in the face every week was me and Seth. Joseph, am I, Joseph, you tell me, am I wrong when I say that? Because you're, you go back and forth with Big Sills here on this, right? It's Seth and myself. So now I know Jonathan Gannon watched the show with Nick. Okay, that's great. I appreciate it. Believe me. Gannon and the child of a quarterback, Murray. Wait a minute, Lucius, the show. I got a take for this. Gannon and that child of a quarterback, Murray, are a match made in heaven. I'm glad the guy's gone. He owes the defensive players his first head coaching paycheck. Lucius, the show, how do you know it's Kyler Murray now? Are you sure Kyler Murray doesn't have rightful bitches about how things go with that organization? I don't know anymore. You got a head coach crying to the Philly media or about him. You got exodus of players everywhere. You had a drunk general manager who resigned. You had another general manager. Who's throwing shade and making accusations against the Bidwell family for sexual harassment? I don't know. Does that sound like a healthy environment to play quarterback in if you're Kyler Murray? If you're Kyler Murray, do you think that's a cool place to work? Man, Jalen's got it great. Jalen's got it great. Good for him. That dude's got it great. (laughs) And by the way, man, a guy like Jonathan Gannon couldn't take the constructive criticism because everybody in Philadelphia was raised. That's right now watching with Buddy Ryan, Bud Carson, Jim Johnson, and Jim Schwartz. And those guys were all aggressive. And when they see soft as britches Jonathan Gannon come in and put a defensive scheme together 
everybody in Philadelphia going, well, that's really not how – I mean, this is the home of Reggie White, dude. This is the freaking home of Andre Waters. Those guys were assassins. They were assassins. And then when you start playing umbrella defense, don't you think people in Philly are going to go, what is that? Not saying it didn't work. But, dog, dog, you got to know where you are. I mean, Philadelphia doesn't enjoy watching Floyd Mayweather fights. They want to watch Mike Tyson fights. That's Philly to me. That You know what Philly is? Watching Tyson fights. One punch, you're out. Get the... I don't want to sit around and watch a guy box for 12 rounds. Jonathan Gannon is the Floyd Mayweather of defensive coordinators. Dude, I want to knock a guy out. If you're on the side of the road and you're almost dying, I want to run you over again. Sit there and help you up? What is that? That's Philly. Here. Dude, this is a football game here, guy. Bernard Hopkins fights. Big Pickens, right. Carson Wentz, thank you. Joe Frazier, right. You know why Bernard Hopkins? Knocking out De La Hoya to the gut. One of the greatest punches of all time. Boom! He's down. I'm like, unbelievable. He knocked out Oscar De La Hoya with a body punch. Tell me that's not Philly. I didn't hit you in the chin, kid. I hit you in the... I hit you in the gut and knocked your ass out. That means wherever I come from, be prepared to get knocked out. That's the fronts of coordinators' minds in that city. Not that shit you played last year. So if they were not used to it, you had to know the room, dude. Kyler Gannon, <laughs> the new Brady Belichick. I love the executioner. Okay. That so, dude, he's actually taking shots at you, also, the head coach of the Arizona Cardinals. I was offended for you guys. I wasn't offended so much he was taking shots and set them. I, I kind of love it because you know me, that's a merit badge for me. But I was like, so Philadelphia hadn't seen a guy play soft as cream pie defense before and it'd be effective. Hey, is that maybe the new NFL? Maybe. We're starting to see more teams do that. Okay. Maybe there's a transition going on. All right. But, bro, don't get don't get yourself butthurt over that stuff. When someone doesn't see something and not used to seeing it and they're used to playing light. Dude, what, what is the one thing that has made Philadelphia a dominant organization since 2000? They kill you on the O-line and they got dominant defensive lines. Once again, you have that again. You have the best front seven, the best defensive line in the NFC East now. Again, you have the best old line. So look, look, look at the Eagles. Once again, you have the best old line and defensive line in the NFC East. Is that a shocker? No. Well, that's not cream puff football, kid. Nobody's playing flag football in Philly. Just because you coach like it's flag football... That, had, that was an adjustment for everyone. You're lucky they won, and you're lucky they played shitty teams. Because if they would have started, that guy would have been fired. How about this? I'll make, a, I'll, make a, I'll make a point to you guys, and you tell me if I'm wrong on this. Jonathan Gannon hadn't gotten that Arizona job, but all those quarterbacks that are coming in, and him not having the ability to stop any of them high-profile quarterbacks, you think he would have survived the year last year as D.C.? Not a chance. Not a chance. You think that guy would have – you think he would have survived all the quarterbacks he's going to face this year? Rodgers, Mahomes, Allen, all them guys. You think he would have survived? Not a chance. Not a chance. Not a chance. He, he kept that job because they won and the players were great. Like we said – Nobody brings in free. That's a how we win. 
That's why when Howie let that defensive court. Dude, I think Sean Desai is a better coordinator than Jonathan Gannon. And you're trying to tell me Matt Patricia. Matt Patricia knows more about defense and defensive schemes and multiple fronts and disguised defenses than that guy will ever know in his entire coaching career. Just because Matt Patricia is not a good def- um, head coach, don't hold the fact against him. Hey, North Turner's not a good head coach. North Turner's a pretty good play caller. Okay? Ernie Zampisi couldn't be a head coach, but he was a hell of a play caller. So here, here's the greatest example. You got it in your own building. Jeff Stoughton is a great old line coach. Why should he make the attempt to be a head coach? You know why he's never tried to be a head coach? Because he knows who he is. University of Miami gave him a little taste of it as interim coach. You know what they said? He hated it. He liked being with his guys. He liked developing offensive. Mario Cristobal took over for him. That's the offensive line coach at Alabama. He said, Jeff Stoutland, dude. Like, there's nobody better. Alex Gibb, Joe Bugle, them kind of dudes. Hudson Hawk, them dudes, absolutely. Some of the best. Larry Bechtel, Tony Weiss. Those guys are all great old line coaches. I mean, taking shots at the Philadelphia sports media and their fans. But then again, you guys are, get this. You know what's funny? You guys probably look at that and laugh. Because this is something that happens every year. Look at the players that have left you. Or people that have left you on a shitty note. You know the only guy really who hasn't taken shots at you is Ben Carson Wentz. I give him credit for that. CJ Gardner-Johnson, who I'm a fan of, got a $6 million raise. He could make eight million. He's talking shit on the Eagles. Dude, why? You won the war. What's the point of that? You're on a pretty good football team. What's the point? <laughs> Crazy, man. So again, for me, I'll take a shot at me. JG, have at it. We'll see how you do in a shitty organization. Like Arizona. Here's my prediction on Jonathan Gannon. He'll be fired in two years. Two years, give him. He'll be fired. Yeah. You know why? He's a liar. Liars in a sport like football don't go far. Because they see through that shit. See, they get paid too. Those players will get a sense of him. And who he is. But then again, he's in a liar's organization. Arizona Cardinals. Okay. Dude, the Cardinals are one of the shitholes of America. For NFL football. And he's in. Look where your two coordinators got jobs. Jim Mersey and Michael Bidwell. Good luck. <laughs> So you're working for Michael Bidwell and Jim Ursay. <laughs> what, what type of success do you think you're going to have in those places? Do you know why? Now I know why Tony Dungy underachieved in Indianapolis. It wasn't because of Coach Dungy and Peyton Manning. It was the owner. Now I know why Peyton Manning wants nothing to do with the Colts. Dude, you look at Peyton Manning, you would swear he played his entire career in Denver. That's right. Hey, Charlie, after working for Jeffrey Laurie, now you're working for Michael Bidwell? Hey, man, you better not let your old lady around the complex. God knows what will happen. (laughs) That's not the best environment. According to multiple people, Charges. And everyone that's worked in the building. Sounds like Jerry Richardson shit all over again. All right. Let's move on. 
I watched that press conference yesterday, and I came away more convinced than ever that B. John Robinson is going to take a lot of the thought process over these next six days on whether or not to take him in the upcoming NFL draft. My point will be this to you today. And I'm going to agree with some of the people in Philly on this. Do I think that the Philadelphia Eagles take B. John Robinson at 10? No, I don't. But if Jalen Carter and if Will Anderson doesn't, I do not believe he's going to fall out of three. I do not believe he is going to get past Arizona. And I don't believe that Arizona is going to trade unless it's with Indianapolis where Indy trades because they pick after them and they go up one and the Cardinals go down one and they get their guy Anderson. There's going to be have probably a gentleman's agreement that they want Anthony Richardson. Anthony Richardson, in my opinion, makes sense in Indy. Makes sense in Indy. Um, because he wants to run the RPO system. I'm going to say something to you about Shane Steichen. I had forgotten this. Shane Steichen had worked with the Charger organization and with Justin Herbert, too. And he's also a big Phillip Rivers fan. And Phillip Rivers was one of the absolutely best quarterbacks to be around. I enjoyed being around him. I got a boatload of pictures of myself and Philip Rivers, and Philip Rivers is a savant. That's the guy that Jalen Hurts watches. You know that Monday night game when they were interviewing Jalen Hurts, the Mannings? They asked him, and the Mannings were pretty surprised because they thought it would be somebody like Michael Vick, somebody like Lamar Jackson. He's like, no. I watch a ton of game film because – Nick Sirianni gave me a ton of game film. Where'd he get it from? Well, he he got it from Nick Sirianni. Nick Sirianni was the OC in Indianapolis for Phillip Rivers. And he was the wide receiver coach in San Diego for Phillip Rivers. Frank was the OC. I was there. I covered it. And all those guys worked together. Rivers is the guy that hurts watches. Rivers is the guy that hurts does a lot of studying on. He said it himself. Okay? He said it himself. That's the guy I really watch a ton of game film on. I watch how he goes through his progressions and his reads, how he sees the game. So, it, it, it Steichen, no wonder Steichen was able to help Jalen. You know, Jalen's talent was something that they brought out, okay? They brought it out. And and I'll say this to you. Is is Lamar Jackson a better player? Probably. Is is Jalen Hurts the better RPO quarterback? Yes. Take that for what you will. Who runs the better RPO, Lamar Jackson? I thought about our topic yesterday. Sills, okay. Lamar's accomplished. He's done a ton. He's 26. Who runs the RPO better? Could Lamar Jackson come into Philadelphia and run with all these wide receivers and tight ends? Could he do what Jalen did? I came to the conclusion, no. I came to the conclusion, no. You know why? Because Baltimore tried to get those guys for him. They tried to bring guys in. And the only guy he connected with was who? The tight end. Which leads me to believe this. Lamar Jackson has a problem in his progression reads. Especially in this. He's not a good RPO decision maker. Jalen's better at it. I think they've got to revamp that offense. I think they've got to simplify it for him. I think they've made it too complicated. Jalen can have a complicated offense. I think that was the the brilliant thing. Showing, get this, think about what you're doing. You're teaching an RPO quarterback. Phillip Rivers progression reads. 
It's not supposed to be that way. They went against the grade in Philly. They went against the grade. Watch this. And guess who processed the information? Hurts. This is what makes him so smart. Jalen took all the information watching how Rivers would go to the tight end. What, what, what did Rivers have? Rivers had Antonio Gates. I believe that RPO offense, in my opinion, in Philadelphia, that entire offense stems off the RPO, off that tight end, and what you do with Goddard. And everyone else is secondary. I don't think the wide receivers on the perimeter dictate the RPO as much as what Goddard does. But Jalen's so smart. And when you have a guy like Goddard in there, what does he do? The middle of the field's wide open. He is a he is a cover nightmare. You're going to put a linebacker on Dallas Goddard? Good luck. You know what makes him better than Zach Ertz? His nose for the end zone. His, he's got a nose for the end zone. Zach Kurtz had a nose for a four-leaf clover on the field after he caught the ball. Catch down. Not that dude. That dude's looking to hurdle people to get into the end zone. Now, did Hurts have better hands? Yes. I like I, Goddard drops a couple too many footballs for my liking. I still think the guy's sensational. He's a baller, dude. But Jalen has that guy, and get this. When you're watching that on that this is what made Brady special. You know, I'm gonna I'm gonna tell you guys if the murderer didn't go to the uh lockup for the rest of his life, Aaron Hernandez, that dual ten that dual tight end set that they were starting to develop in New England would have been undefensible. You couldn't have defended Hernandez and and Gronk. Not a chance. They would have ran two tight end set, and those guys would have been streak. Randy Moss would have had a hundred touchdown catches. They you couldn't have defended that. If that guy doesn't go to lock up Aaron Hernandez, that dual tight end set would have been incredible to defend. And it was becoming, you started seeing it. You were like, dude, nobody can defend this thing. Remember? When they were doing that at the beginning of it, everyone was like, holy shit, this thing is going to be a tough. You had to have linebackers like Ryan Shazier, Derek Brooks. You, you in theory, had to have cover two linebackers that could play the run, which is not common. You had to find special linebackers to cover them tight ends. You're not covering Dallas Goddard with TJ Edwards. You're not. Marshall says, I agree. That's why our offense took a drop and changed when Goddard got hurt completely. And if you think about it, let me ask you guys this. Please give me an education here on this. Was Goddard back in the Chicago game? Was he back yet for the Chicago game when Hurts got hurt in that game? Because to me, I'm telling you, Jalen Hurts, is the best RPO runner of that style of offense I've ever seen. There. Is he more talented than Vic and Lamar Jackson? No. But in that system, he is the best I've ever seen. And listening to those guys at the press conference yesterday sold me on it. They're paying him for his decision-making on the field and how he sees the game. Okay, he came back at Dallas. Goddard was not back yet. I think that may have played into him getting banged up. Here on Jalen Hurts. I thought about that topic yesterday. If you had to start your team with Lamar Jackson – or Jalen Hurts. It depends on what you want to run. If you want to run a reckless RPO system, you run with Lamar. But if you want to run an offense and taking advantage of all the gifted players that they have on their football team right now, 
and taking advantage of everyone, then you get Jalen Hurts' ass in there. And yes, he is worth $51 million then. If you're running that style, and I, I heard this yesterday at the press conference, we don't want to change anything. No. But what I also heard was this. But we have to be smarter. We have to be smarter. Would Debo would be a 1,400-yard receiver in our offense. You know what I would want Jamison Smith, Debo to do? 1,200 yards receiving, 500 yards in jet sweeps, a couple carries in the backfield. If I lose A.J. Brown or Devontae Smith, so be it. I can't lose the guy that's the quarterback. I can't lose the quarterback. I could lose A.J. I'll go get another one. I'll go get another A.J. Brown. I'll make a trade. How he's... How... Go get another one. Go get D.K. Metcalf. Run these horses until their hoofs break. I don't care. I'm not losing him. They got to be smarter. Ray, Debo Samuel is a spectacular football player. Any football team in their right mind would want him on the team. Don't kid yourself. No to Debo? Come on, guy. Isn't it funny? Most of the great wide receivers in the NFL today are second-round picks or lower. What does that tell you? Don't be snowed by some of the guys that you see in the upcoming draft because they went to fancy schools and they got fancy numbers and shitty programs. I mean, I had to look it up. Debo Samuel went to South Carolina? Really? I do not remember him at all with the Gamecocks. I do not remember him at all. DK Metcalf, I do not remember him. Devontae Adams, I never heard of Devontae Adams until he got to Green Bay. Since he was at Fresno State. I don't watch Fresno State football. Cooper Cup. All these dudes were not first-round picks. The majority of the star receivers in the game today are later round picks. Do you know in the last 15 years of the all pros and pro bowlers, 65% of those guys were not first rounders. That's all you need to know. We're not first rounders. If you miss on a guy and you get him in the second or third, this comes down to Jalen Hurts developing that guy. By the way, what 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 helped Jalen Hurts was having a running back that gave him 1300 yards and 11 touchdowns. You know why? Look at the multitude of weapons he has when he snaps the ball. Think of this. Hurts walks to the line of scrimmage. He's got a thousand yard receiver, a thousand yard receiver, a thousand yard tight end, and a 1300 yard back, and the best O line. I'm telling you, as a coordinator, I'm sitting on the other side saying, What the F are they going to do? You have them on the defense mentally. That's why. When, you, when you're playing defense, you're trying to get the advantage on an offense. What would you do against a – here, here. What do you do against Rodgers? You know what you do against Aaron Rodgers? Stop the run game and keep him in the box. Don't let him get out in the perimeter. Aaron Rodgers is great in open space. Keep him in the box. That's how the 49ers beat him. Keep him in the box. Stop Aaron Jones. You win the ball game. Here's how you stop Dak. Stop the run. Dak will throw a pick. Okay? You want to know how you beat Arizona? You don't let D-Hop get nuts. And you keep continually hitting Kyler Murray. You know why? He'll quit. He'll quit. You know how you beat Brady? Injuries. 
Dude, what stopped Tom Brady last year in Tampa? Their entire offensive line was gone. They couldn't get a run game. Brady needs a running game. Why? He's a play-action quarterback. You took play-action away from Tom Brady? He made a career on play-action. That's his career. Seam passes, running game. And if the running game is not going, intermediate passing, short passing game. Michelle getting across the middle out of the slot. That's what made him successful. Nobody would ever confuse Tom Brady on being a deep passer. He became more of a deep threat. Why? Tom Brady never played in New England with better wide receiving talent than with Godwin and with Mike Evans and with Gronkowski when they won the Super Bowl in his entire career in New England. Why wouldn't he take advantage of that? That's why he had more deep passes in Tampa. He had more jump ball opportunities in Tampa, so he took advantage of it. But what happened when they were 7-5 and five and they lost to the Bears on that Thursday night? What happened? You guys remember? Brady went to Ar- Arians and went like this. Bruce told me. Uh, we're going back to the old New England way. Short passes, short passes, short passes. Run the game. Um, playoff, Lenny. Let's go. They win it. That's how they won the Super Bowl. That's a high percentage play. Those are too much in high percentage turnover plays when you're throwing the ball down the field like that. Jalen doesn't have high turnover plays. That's the one thing also that's another key component to this RPO thing. Look at how he sees this. The low turnovers. You see, here, here, here's something to think about. Would you rather have a quarterback that throws for 35 touchdowns and have 12 picks? Or would you? Or would you rather have a quarterback that throws for 25 touchdowns and has six interceptions? What would you rather have? Think about that. I know I get on your case, and I kid you a lot, by the way, that Jalen hasn't thrown for 30 touchdowns. You give me the 25 touchdowns with six picks and 700 yards rushing and 10 touchdowns and 2,000-yard receivers? Bro, that differential in touchdown to interceptions is 3-1. to one. It's three to one. When you're three to one like that, it's a win. 35 touchdowns. Ask Kirk Cousins if that wins you important ball games. Ask you if that really helps you at the end of the day when it comes. And you, you know, one thing about Rivers that I always had a cow with him a little bit over was he had the Dan Marino factor. You know what that is? He's going to throw the ball like Josh Allen into tight windows no matter what. Why? Because he's so in love with his arm and his ability that sometimes he doesn't understand. Bro, you know, live and learn to live another day. Punting is part of the game too. Brady's patience, Jalen's patience is completely the most important thing that you take away from it. Mahomes loses patience. He can be beat. That's why you see teams like the Colts beat him. You know why? You frustrate him. Jam his receivers. Juju Smith-Schuster. You see, that's what Jonathan Gannon thought he was going to do, is jam those shitty receivers in Kansas City. What happened in the second half? They ran crossing routes on him. And Jonathan Gannon had no effing answers for that. That just shows you what a shitty DC he was. Dude, stay back. Do what you did all year to win those games. Let your front seven go nuts. No, he thought he changed the game up in the game. I mean, it was totally a Marty Schottenheimer move. Jonathan Gannon looked, was like the Marty Schottenheimer D coordinators in that game. Terrible, terrible mentality by the DC. How about this? The DC put your team in a position to lose. And because the Eagles were so talented, they still almost won it. Can't be that way. Coaching in the NFL matters. I told you. Nick Saban couldn't coach a guy in the NFL to save his life. You just can't. He likes to be the head chief in charge. He likes to have his own moat. He likes to have all this bullshit, you know, of telling me how great he is. 
But what one thing does he do? He has great assistant coaches. You have great assistant coaches in that building. He's a great recruiter. But in the NFL, everyone's great. Coaching matters in the NFL. Putting your players in a position to succeed is the most important thing that a coach could do for any player. And by the way, here's another one. When he couldn't figure out how to stop the run, he went and moaned to, he went and moaned to Howie. Howie went to the milkshake stand and ended up getting Linville Joseph, and he had to go get a Dominic and Sue. He couldn't coordinate it out. What did Dan Quinn do? They were having trouble stopping the run. Quinn schemed it up. That's a coordinator. That's what a coordinator does. He doesn't go crying to the front office and blame the players because there's not enough personnel on the field. What was your excuse then, Jonathan Gannon, in the Super Bowl? Talent? That's what he'd tell you. Okay? That's what he would – Jonathan ta- Jonathan Gannon would tell you he lost the Super Bowl because of talent, not because of him. There's coaches like that. The brother blame the player. Then he goes to Arizona and cries and moans about being shit on because of his style of coaching. Hey, guy, suck it up. Welcome to the big leagues. Geez, I would have thought one thing about Philadelphia. At least they would have schooled you on being a little tougher. Shit, man. Ben Simmons is tougher than this guy. I don't hear Ben crying about Philly. This guy's moaning and bitching, and he got the big job in Arizona. What a worm. Honestly. Dude, you are exactly who I thought you were. That guy's exactly who I thought he was. You know how you should leave Philly? Hey, man, thank you so much for all the opportunity. To be around great players and to have an ability to be able to work for Jeffrey Laurie and Nick Sirianni and Howie Roseman, it was just a real great honor to be in that building. I have nothing more to say. Frank Reich says that all the time, every time he talks about the Eagles. And this is after he got fired in Indianapolis. It's so much so that he kind of showed his hand that the Eagles wanted him back as offensive coordinator. The week of the Super Bowl, when everyone knew that Steichen was taking the Colts job, Frank came on our program. Yeah, they reached out to me on being the offensive coordinator. And I'm going like this. Oh, okay. Well, that's not out there. And this guy's bitching and moaning about how tough you are in Philly. Good. Bro, hey, can you imagine what Buddy Ryan would have did with that defense? How many quarterbacks do you think would have been killed in this season last year if Buddy was your D.C.? How about if Dan Quinn was your D.C.? If Dan Quinn was the defensive coordinator, even Gus Bradley. I'll take Gus Bradley. You put Gus Bradley as your D coordinator in Philly? Shit. What's up with that Vic Fangio guy? I know you guys are high on him. What's he done? Vic Fangio school? Of what? Vic Fangio. Hey, when I'm looking at a D coordinator, I'm looking at a guy that's actually won something. Gus Bradley put that Legion of Boom together with Dan Quinn. Those are quality coordinators. Matt Patricia, quality coordinator. Okay, here, think about this. Do you think that Matt Patricia has ever had the talent in New England on the defensive side of the football that Jonathan Gannon had last year in Philly? Do you? This guy had Fletcher Cox, Javon Hardgrave, Brandon Graham, Josh Sweat. I don't ever remember a collection of dudes like that in New England. Hightower was a good ball player. Probably better than TJ. Okay. But outside of that, Kaiser could have – what here? Watch this. Brandon Graham could have played in New England during the Brady Super Bowl. Fletcher Cox could have played in the – Super Bowl era in New England. Javon Hardgrave could have played for New England and started. Josh Sweat could have played in New England and started. 
Kaiser White could have played in New England and started. Darius Slade could have played at the corner and started in New England. James Bradbury could have started in New England. Gardner Johnson could have started in New England during the Super Bowl time. Dude, those guys didn't have superstar players on that side of the ball. They schemed it up with Patricia and with Belichick. In-game adjustments, like I said, all of that. All of that. Gannon has had more talent the last two years than Patricia ever had in New England. That's why they're bringing them in. Because you know why? They're going to disguise fronts. He's great at multiple fronts, 34, 43, 50 look, bear look, all that. Wide nines, sevens. They do all that in New England. They do all that. I want to hit on a little bit more. By the way, um, my boy Jason Cole's going to join us. He's got a book out. Check this out. Tom Brady, his father, has a lot of cool things in here. And he sat down with Jason, Tom Brady's dad. And get this, I talked to Jason yesterday. You think Tom Brady's coming back? So that is right there at the bottom, see that? A lot of stories from Tom Brady's dad in here. It's pretty cool. It's a kid's book. And look at the title, Shut Up, Your Kid Is Not That Great. So we're going to do that. We'll have him in the last hour of the program. How he said something yesterday that I was so thrilled to hear. I haven't even really got to my topics here. I mean, just listening to Jonathan Gannon talk and take a, sh a shade at you guys and throw shade at you guys, this was dumb. I just, okay, just, it didn't make sense. Act like you, act like you got the big job, guy. Hour number two, hit the like button. Keep it here on the National Football Show.